Hi. Uh, before you say not him again, uh, I've got a different topic today. So um, this is actually a, a topic that was requested from, from your committee, uh, Tech Transfer. But before I get to that, I, I wanted to say a huge thank you to the folks that organized the committee and, and the folks here. Everybody's been so nice. Mary and I have had a, had a ball, and it, uh, it was, it's just been a really good conference for us. So, so thank you. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to say is that there is a group of New Zealand beekeepers that regularly come to the states to attend some of our bee meetings. Um, there's our national meeting, unfortunately, comes in January. There's two national organizations, and they, they meet in January, which is hard if you're a, that would be the middle of your summer. But we do have another meeting that that's, uh, happens in July or August. It's called the Eastern Apicultural Society meeting. And there's a group of, uh, of Kiwis that have been coming consistently there. And if you, you are able to, uh, to look at that, you, you would really enjoy it. It's a week-long uh, meeting. The first half is, is focuses on education, and the second half is a general meeting. But you get some wonderful speakers, and, and it's a lot of fun. So anyhow, um, tech transfer. Um, what is tech transfer? So this is actually a a term that I think we either borrow or stole from the Canadians. Uh, the first tech transfer teams that I was aware of were in Ontario. It was a collaboration of the universities and the beekeeping groups and the minister. And basically what they are is they're crop consultants for beekeepers. They, they come out and uh, they will check your hives for, I guess in this case here, they would check them for fowl brood if that was a concern for you. Uh, they would check them for varroa mites, give you levels. They could do uh, nosema loads. We can actually do virus scans uh, in the States, uh, pollen analysis. There's various services that you can get. Uh, so the problem that we have as beekeepers is when something goes wrong, or, or especially in the current situation where it's just a challenge to keep bees alive. <clears throat> Sometimes you just need a little bit of extra help. Um, and we really don't have a lot of that. At least in the States, we don't have that. Our extension services, which used to be a lot more uh, better supported, uh, have really gone away. So um, it's, a, it's another set of helping hands. Now, our program in the States, we actually uh, are using them uh, a little bit more than that. It's not just a service to the beekeepers, but the information that they collect, it goes into a database. And that becomes valuable because uh, when this discussion comes up with what is the problem with honeybee health, and if, uh, uh, you know, let's say the chemical companies say it's all about varroa, and you show that your varroa levels have been consistently low, but you're still losing a lot of bees, uh, that kind of, of, of information from an independent third party becomes really useful. So um, the information that they collect is, is useful to the beekeeper, but also on a larger scale the, to, to fill the database. Um, BMPs are best management practices. That's a kind of a, relative, a newer term for beekeepers. It means that there are things that work better than others. And uh, the Bee Informed Partnership, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, has been collecting that information. They're looking at successful operations, and they want to figure out why they're successful. And uh, we have a lot of new beekeepers in the States, particularly backyard and sideliner beekeepers that are trying to learn. It's, a, it's not an easy thing to learn beekeeping. So some of this information, they put, put it together into a format that's useful for new beekeepers. Um, the big, one of the big things that the first tech transfer team did was work with queen producers to improve our queen stock. I've listened to some of the presentations about your concerns with American fowl brood, and, and I know that you don't use uh, antibiotics here, but uh, there's been a lot of work done with hygienic queens or hygienic bee stocks that, that really clean up, either clean up varroa, um, clean up uh, American fowl brood, or they have the, the uh, ability to, to completely wipe it out. So there are genetic solutions, but somebody has to coordinate that effort to work with queen breeders, and I'll, I'll talk just a little bit about that. Um, pesticide issues are a real concern. There is an emergency kit that, that you can do uh, through the tech transfer teams. Uh, some people use that. And the last thing is there's so many new products now. We have probiotics for bees. We have all these different uh, products that people are coming up with. 
if you want to know if they work or don't work, one of uh, the tech teams have been, used, been, been working with beekeepers to test them in the field, which is, which is really nice. So currently, oh, and this is a work in progress. It, it, uh, it's been around um, seven or eight years. Uh, we're still developing, but currently we have five teams. The California team was the first team to, uh, to work together, and uh, they really f work with the queen breeders. Now, these guys also produce honey and do other things, but a lot of emphasis there was on proving the, the queen stock. And there's 500,000 to, to 700,000 queens produced in California every year. So the thought is if you can improve, if you can work with those, those queen, individual queen breeders, the, I think there's 12 or 15 that, that are currently working with the team, you can really have an impact on the industry. Uh, the Midwest team is based out of the University of Minnesota. They work with honey producers. We, um, we have a Texas team, Oregon team, uh, Michigan. Uh, there's a lot of beekeepers in Michigan. There's a team there. There was a team in Florida, but it, it really wasn't performing well, so they, they changed that. And it's, a, it's an evolving process. I can anticipate that we're going to expand this program as we're able to uh, and as we have funding. Uh, and Maryland is the home base for all of this. So, these are not my slides. I, I borrowed them from the Be Informed Partnership. Um, <clears throat> the whole concept of tech transfer is wonderful, but the challenge is who's going to administer it. And this is not a government program. Uh, they've got some grants and funding from the U U.S. Department of Agriculture, but it's an independent group, Be Informed Partnership. Uh, they started, I think, 2011 is when they were actually formed. Uh, with a, a, a CAP grant, that's a Coordinated Agricultural Production Grant from the USDA. It was a five or six million dollar grant. It was a very big amount uh, with the concept that <clears throat> we could, that there was a recognition that there were problems uh, with bees and, and in the bee industry, but nobody knew how to, what to do with that. So this group was formed. Um, it's actually, there's a board of, of a dozen beekeepers that, that serve on this and try to keep it going in the right direction. And it's, it's probably as good a collaboration that you're going to get between commercial beekeepers and researchers. It, a lot of this is, is uh, depending on the people, but commercial beekeepers are involved to try to keep it productive. And the goals were very simple, reduce colony mortality. We're averaging 30 or 40 percent loss in the U.S., and we want to sort out why. Uh, funding is, oh, any time you try to do something, something like this, it's, it's always a challenge to pay for it. So the initial grant money, came. a lot of it came from USDA. Um, Be Informed also administers some of the, the national surveys, which they get paid for to, to administer that. Uh, beekeepers that partic participate in the program, uh, it's a three-year program. If you, if you start up the first year, you're subsidized at 50 or 60 percent of the cost is, is paid by the grant and, and you, you have a, a, a lower cost to get involved. And as you, you move into it, there are fees that you pay every year. And we're always playing with that because uh, I, I'm on the board, so I say we. Uh, we're always playing with that because we want participation. The goal is to have good participation and we don't want the cost of the program to be a problem. But beekeepers are paying quite a bit to, to be involved. Uh, <clears throat> we are getting fees now to test uh, products, uh, whether it's probiotics or, or other things that are added to the hive. We've tested some mite treatments and other things with the tech transfer teams, and there's usually a fee associated with, with that. Uh, we get a lot of donations. We get them from bee clubs. We get them from the national beekeeping organizations. Um, we have a, a funding source. We're actually getting a fair bit of corporate money uh, in Costco. has been putting four or $500,000 a year into uh, to bee research every year. They donate it to another organization called Project APSM, and Project APSM is, is aligned closely with the Bee Informed Partnership. So there's lots of different ways that money, startup money is involved, but the goal is for, for user fees and, and uh, corporate fees to, to run this program. Uh, that's a blank slide. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's not my slide. Okay, <laughs> let's see. Uh, this is going to get really interesting. I'm going to—I don't work off a script, so this is going to be a challenge to see what happened here. This is not my slideshow. Um, 
Okay, so what we do. <laughs> Let's keep going and see what happens. <laughs> So I guess what I can say is the tech transfer teams are oriented towards commercial beekeepers. Um, there's other programs that Bee Inform does. Uh, Sentinel apiaries would be with, if you had eight hives or more, you could participate and you, you do monitoring uh, each year and you report. The, the key is to get that information into the database. The emergency response kits are when you have pesticide damage. It's a way to, to get the analysis. Um, the loss and management surveys, those are through the USDA. Um, and, uh, the, the, okay, this is working. Here we go. That's, that's my slide, or, or a borrowed slide. So 2005, 2006 is when, it's kind of a turning point in, in U.S. beekeeping. Uh, the winter of 05, there were tremendous losses. Uh, USDA sent their best scientists out, and they really didn't figure, they were, the hives were dead, um, but they, they, they couldn't come up with anything conclusive. And before that time, all we really had was, was a limited amount of information. So this is where the whole concept of pu pulling together a way to collect information from beekeepers started. And if you, you may have seen this National Loss Survey. This is, this is organized through Bee Informed, and it's very useful when you're discussing this. As a beekeeper, if you, if you in the U.S. now, if you go someplace and you tell somebody you're a beekeeper, the questions seem to come out. It used to be we could fly under the radar. Now everybody, the public seems to know there's problems and they, they consistently want to know, is it any better? Is the problem solved? And these lost data uh, are useful to say that the problem hasn't really gone away. We still have a lot of issues. One other thing that this chart is a little bit small, it might be hard for you to, to, to see, but since uh, 2000 and uh, the last four or five years, if you see that red bar there, uh, previous it was always winter loss that we were looking at. If you can read that chart a little bit better than I can, uh, you'll see that it's broken down to winter loss and summer loss. Uh, an interesting thing that, that has come out of this is that beekeepers are losing a lot of bees throughout the summer. So that's from your high count, you finish making your splits, you go through them, you check them, you take them to your honey producing areas or, or through your summer season, and you're losing 15, 20, or 30% or of your bees during the summer. And this just is, is uh, it's a surprise to a lot of folks, but it's reality for, for beekeepers that are in the field. But this is uh, useful information to know that it's not just winter loss. Okay, so I was supposed to talk about tech teams. This is, a, this is one of my slides here. Uh, tech teams uh, come out to your, your bee yard. They work with you. They will they, uh, do pretty much what services you need. Uh, if you're a queen producer and you want to do a hygienic test, they'll work with that. You know, certainly one of the primary things is to, to take uh, varroa mite levels before and after your treatments. Uh, you can adjust the, the service to, to work for you. Um, and uh, this is basically what they do. They, they have a sheet that they record a lot of information on it. Varroa, varroa accounts would be one. They take samples to send back to the lab for, for varroa accounts and for nosema accounts. Uh, nosema serrana, uh, I don't know if, you, if you're finding that here, but nosema serrana will, will be very erratic. It'll go up, it'll go down uh, with treatment, without treatment. But we think, as beekeepers, that it's a, it's a, a stress factor. When you, when you see the bees under stress, it seems to, to really go up in the summer. And it's, we still don't fully understand it, but we're monitoring it to see what happens. Uh, and the goal, here's one of a participating uh, a beekeeper. They're out sampling hives. And they don't look at every, every hive, but there's a, a prescribed... Um, method of, of how many hives they collect samples from. Uh, these are the things that they'll record. Uh, is it a single? Is it a double? Is it a triple? Is it making honey? Uh, what kind of condition? Uh, queen status. Is it queenless? Is it a, they rate the queen, I think it's on a one to five scale, how well she's doing. Frames of bees. Uh, the weight of the hive is, is an estimate. We don't necessarily have scales here. If a, if a beekeeper chose to have scale hives, they could record that, but most commercial beekeepers aren't doing that. Uh, certainly the other thing, brood pattern and, uh, and, and your disease loads. These are the, you know, the U.S., these are the four teams that are they're scattered out, and 
there's a fair bit of movement from one to another. The, the Michigan team in the winter would typically be working with their migratory beekeepers that sent hives to California. They would travel to California and check those hives in the winter. Or if they, uh, Michigan beekeepers sent hives to Florida, they would travel to Florida. And they would coordinate with their beekeepers to try to provide the services so that they could meet that. The same thing with the Texas team. The Texas team would be probably have a, a few folks from, from the north spending time with them in the winter. And then uh, in the summer, that Texas team would travel a lot of times to the Midwest with, with their beekeepers. So it's, uh, it's organized, our current system is organized through the university. So each of the teams works through uh, either the, the University of California or Oregon. And what that does is we are able to use the resources of each of those universities in that. So there's, there's a lot of organization that goes with the, the be informed, a lot of stuff behind the scenes here. These are, are some of the tech team, these are the tech team members, and you'll notice they're young people. They're, they don't necessarily have to have a beekeeping background. This is a technician's job. It, it's funny that we've had some folks that have gone through the program and gone on to become commercial beekeepers. Um, when they're selected, uh, a key, there's a few things that are important. You know, obviously they, they need to be uh, competent and, and smart people, but um, this is, in many cases, this is the future of, of working with beekeepers. We, we have a lot of good folks. On the, all the way to the left, that's your California team, John and Rob. Um, top of the middle, that's your Michigan team, Dan. Uh, below him, with the veil on, that's your uh, Minnesota team. Uh, next to him is the Texas team, although that doesn't look like Texas. Uh, and then all the way to, the, uh, to my right, I guess it's your right also, uh, is the Oregon team. So, the, the teams are either one or two people, and as I mentioned just previously, they work together. So in California, with California almonds, a lot of times you'll get all of these team, team members to show up in California almonds, and they'll work together, because that's where most of the, they're, they're beekeepers. Uh, and each team will probably have 12 to 15 beekeepers that they work with. So there was a lot of question when this first started out, what, what can these teams do? So, they provide uh, information back to the beekeeper. They take that information and put it into the database. They do not release information about one beekeeper to another beekeeper. That would, would really kill the whole program. Uh, initially, there was some concern whether the, the tech team members could give recommendations to the beekeepers because working with 12 or 15 beekeepers, you see a difference. One guy's more successful than the other, and they had to be careful not to compare and contrast, and that was, was a real challenge. And in selecting these folks, it had to be important that, that they, uh, a lot of proprietary information in each bee, beekeeper's outfit. Uh, now, because we've been doing this for five years, uh, it's been, uh, uh, the, the tech team members are allowed to give information back. If they see a problem and they have a recommendation, they can't say that your beekeeper down the street is doing this, but they can say that our data, that, that's really what they're relying on. Our data shows that if you do this or do that, um, you'll be more successful. And that's where the database comes in. So they're working with the data and they can share information back. And, and honestly, they're really, really a nice bunch of, uh, of people, so you get to be friendly with them and you look forward to them coming to, uh, to visit you. I, I use the, uh, the tech transfer teams when I had, uh, had a business. But beekeepers aren't easy to work with. And uh, once again, this isn't my slide, but it works. Uh, they're, they're an odd bunch. Uh, I think mental illness is, uh, is not unusual. So... Um, we, we like to, commercial beekeepers like to consider themselves farmers, but, uh, you know, social skills are not required to, 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 to be a successful beekeeper. So, hey, there's another good slide. Let's try this again. Oh, okay, it's going to come one at a time. This is how it's working. So, one of the things that, I'll be honest with you, not about the crazy people, but a lot of commercial beekeepers don't do a good enough job monitoring particularly for varroa mites. They get behind, they get busy. So one of the things that, that really works well is when you have somebody come and check, if you're doing a great program yourself uh, and you're monitoring your, your, your mite loads consistently, then this is just confirmation that you're doing a good job. 
But if you got behind and you haven't been looking, it's really nice when these guys show up and say, oh, by the way, this is your mic count, and you might want to think about doing something fairly soon. Um, you can adjust the schedule. The, the, you know, they're, they're busy, but it's a service that they're providing. So you determine when you want these, these folks to come out and help you. Um, these experiments, beekeepers have questions. You know, is this product better than that? And, and we've actually had beekeepers ask us, how do we know, how do we compare these different things? So in your own operation, if, you're, if you want to try product X versus product Y and have the tech teams monitor it, kind of an independent third party, um, that's another thing that they can, they can do for you. Um, when you have a pesticide issue, we have emergency kits, you can take samples of bees, you can take samples of wax, you can take samples of pollen, and we have labs that we can send them to. There's a fee for that, but I've, I've, I've experienced pesticide loss. It's, it's really, it's, it, it knocks you back quite a bit. Uh, I mean, not just the economics, but it really, uh, it, it sometimes becomes an emotional experience because you really get connected to your bees. So it's nice to have somebody that you can call we need help, can you help us? And they show up. Um, I, I wanna talk a little bit more in a minute about the hygienic program because it really has made a difference. Um, improving the queen stocks nationally has, has, has really been important. So in my own case, I was raising my own uh, queens and I would have them do the hygienic test, which is a very simple thing. I, I think Sue, I don't have a slide with me, but Sue showed that you take a, a PVC pipe, a three or four inch pipe, you set it on your comb and you pour liquid nitrogen. It takes 15 or 20 minutes for the nitrogen to kill all the brood. You put it back in, into that, it's, it's good brood. You pick a, a hive with good brood. You put it back into the, the hive and you look at it the next day. And there's a significant difference among bees, how well they clean it out. The bees that clean out uh, most of that dead brood are hygienic. The ones that don't do as much, you don't select from those in your, your, your breeding program. And, and in a relatively short time, in three or four or five years, when you do this consistently, it's amazing how quickly you can really select for hygienic bees. Uh, and once, once again, I mentioned that beekeepers a lot of times get busy, they, they miss something. It's nice to have somebody checking behind you, and even to uh, emotional support sometimes. Uh, it varies from beekeeper to beekeeper, but on average, it's, it's at least four times a year that, that your tech team would meet with you. Uh, if you're a southern beekeeper, those months would be a little bit different, but on average, you, you would like them to be looking at least four times a year. In my own operation, we were doing monitoring every month consistently, and, and it was really valuable to stay on top of our, our mite counts, but this would be a confirmation. And for those guys who aren't doing it four times a year, then these guys would show up and, and check things. Uh, the report that they give you, at first it's a little confusing, but um, you could, they email it to you typically. Uh, they'll tell you all the different colony assessments. One of the things I found really interesting is our viral report. And the viruses, we, there's so much we don't understand about viruses, but in the field, there's no way we can really identify them. When we send bees in with the tech, tech people, they can give us a viral report. And certain yards, sometimes we have a yard that's just not doing as well as the other. So we take them to that yard to look at it. And, and you want to know a virus is playing a part in this. So this is a tool that, for the beekeepers where, where they can tell. Um, the program is relatively new, um, it's still evolving, but working with queen producers to, to stress hygienic behavior has been, been, I don't have the graphs to show it, but uh, in a relatively short period of time, we're 90% we're and above pretty consistently. When you have those facts and figures back to you, uh, there's a competition among queen producers. They want to be as good as everybody else. So you get your results in comparison with everybody else's. And if your bees are not doing as well, it just makes you want to do that much better. So getting that information back and doing those tests consistently has really made a difference. Uh, I'm going to show you a, uh, some charts here about lower mite loads, the same, same issue. And certainly I mentioned testing new products. Uh, this is, uh, let's see, A through L, those would all be different beekeepers. This is in 2012, and you see that at least three of the, four of those beekeepers are over, three, we're using three mites 
per hundred as a, as a threshold level. So you see most of the beekeepers are doing really well, but there's four beekeepers that, that aren't doing as well. So that's 2012. Look at 2013. Isn't that good? That's because of better monitoring and comparing you to, to other beekeepers. So there's a value there to get everybody's mite loads down. But that's a, a success story right there. Uh, here's another example. Uh, you're looking at June 2014, Ju June 2015 here. It's actually identified. Um, Varroa mites, this is national averages. They're averaging out with several people. The goal is to get those mite loads down. And, and how you do that, now the tech team members don't tell you which products to use, they don't tell you how to treat, but they're giving you the information, uh, they're, they're giving you an assessment for how good you're doing, and that's enough to work with. So um, it's an evolving program. Uh, we've had some of our tech team members that have been with us for four or five years. Sometimes they move on, we've got to bring new people in. Building trust with the beekeeper has been a real challenge, but, but it's working. Um, and the fact that, that the information is coming back to the beekeepers has been useful. These are some of the groups that are involved uh, with, with this. Uh, Project APSM, I'm, I'm also on the board. That's a group of um, beekeepers and almond growers chose to support bee research. And, and we've got a, a budget of two or three million dollars a year that we're putting into to bee research. You know, certainly the USDA, the Almond Board has been wonderful. They spend a couple hundred thousand dollars a year on bee research. So these are uh, some of the groups that are, uh, that are big sponsors. You see the universities on the bottom. Uh, this is the website. Uh, if you want to follow what we're doing, there's, there's actually two different sites. The, the second one, uh, you can find bip2.beinformed.org. Would, would be showing you more of the facts and figures. Take your pictures, go ahead. <laughs> I figured you might have missed it at the beginning. Um, if you just Google Be Informed, all this stuff will come up. But these are the kind of charts that will show up that we're, now we're able, after five or six years of consistently collecting this information, um, I think our, our tech transfer panel later this afternoon will be talking a little bit about this. Uh, you can see state by state what your, your levels are, uh, viruses, uh, varroa levels. Um, you can get this online. Uh, the Sentinel apiaries, uh, tech transfer teams are mostly for commercial beekeepers, but if you're a small beekeeper with, and you want to participate, there is a program where you, you collect information, and, and the key is to send it into the database. And if you look at this chart, there's a lot more points there, and there are areas that, that might not be picked up by the tech transfer team. There's discussion of getting more teams or, or training people, but this is citizen science. This, this is, is great. And, and a lot of the, part of this is, is a scale hive, and uh, there's a fellow from, from NASA that's been working with scale hives to, to document uh, how climate change is impacting honey production. And he's got data for the last 20 years on scale hives to show how the plants are blooming at different times than they did 20 years ago. And it, it, that's a short period of time, but this kind of information is really cool. Uh, you can see that, that commercial beekeepers lose less hives than, than hobby beekeepers. When we have this discussion about treatment-free versus treating, uh, there's clear data through Bee Informed to show that if you don't treat for mites, your bees die uh, on average. Um, these are our other charts to show that uh, the the you, you, how many, um, the natural growth of mites is, is here. And this, these are national averages here. And here, you're, you're, why is this happening? So you see this happening. Why is it happening? In some cases, this is Beekeepers will report that they treated and their mite loads are still going up. So this is identifying, um, we have varroa bombs and, and it's pushing the whole agenda on how to, to deal with these problems a little bit more. Uh, more. So um, I'm out of time. Uh, I think I got a few minutes.